Thank you, Gregor. Thank you for having me, everybody. Um, sort of just milling around detecting the accents. You guys have come a long way to the one day of the year we get sunshine. You've locked yourself in a cave, so good, uh, good job on that one. But um, we, we, um, we lost my name. I think you heard from Alex this morning. Um, we, we make uh, children's, uh, children's books, um, and we generate a lot of data. Obviously, we're customers of, uh, of Solidus, and um, um, I, I think I'm, I'm here to talk to you about essentially how we're using that data, not less, you know, less so about the sort of technical side of our infrastructure and, um, you know, sort of how we sort of um, uh, deal with the kind of data collection and much more about how we drive commercial value from, uh, from the information that we collect. So I hope it's of interest to you guys, but um, um, I think it's some interesting things that uh, we've been, been able to achieve in the last year at Lost My Name, and, uh, and yeah, I'm excited to be sharing that with you. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about Lost My Name. Alex may have um, spoke to you about it already. I, I kind of want to give you a bit of context about the, the business so that it makes sense for some of the things that I'll show you later on. Uh, I'll talk a bit about uh, business intelligence, of course, and what we do. But crucially, my, my talk's mostly going to be focused around, as I said, how we drive value from it, how we essentially make um, better decisions um, as a business that, that, that ultimately improve our products and, and our experience for customers. Okay. So about Lost My Name, um, so we make, um, we make uh, essentially personalized products for, for children. So primarily we make books. Um, uh, Lost My Name is our kind of hero title, um, obviously. Uh, it's sold well over two million copies worldwide. Uh, it's, a fantastic, it's a fantastic product. We recently introduced a couple of new books, uh, Journey Home last year and Kingdom of You uh, came out a couple of months ago. We've got another one coming out this week and then several more throughout the year. So we've got a really exciting product roadmap coming ahead along. Uh, and we started moving into some other categories as well, like games and decor and, and, and various other bits and pieces. But primarily, we, uh, we, we do books. And what's special about our products is that they're, is that they're personalized to the child. They're, they're not just sort of, you know, the name sort of tagged into the book or, or stuck on the cover. The actual stories and the, the, the kind of, um, the, the products themselves change based on the name or the characteristics or in the journey home, the, the address and the location of the, uh, uh, of the child. Uh, and it lost my name. It's a pretty straightforward um, concept. Essentially, um, the child um, goes up, loses their name. They wake up. They can't remember who they are. They go on this adventure to try and find, you know, their, um, themselves. And they meet various characters who each give them a, a letter of their name. So I go along and I meet, you know, I meet the robot. I meet the Yeti, uh, the Aardvark, and, and um, the Narwhal. Um, I, I slightly embarrassed me, didn't realize a narwhal is a real thing. Uh, I thought it was a made-up creature. And I sort of went up to our writer and said, oh, how did you come up with that idea? He said, it's an actual animal. Uh, <laughs> I think I missed that version of, uh, uh, of Planet Earth. But um, it's, it's, it's a really beautiful product. As I mentioned, it's, it's, it's done fantastically well uh, and, 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 um, and um, is, our kind of, is our kind of lead product. The way that um, the products are made are all through our e-commerce platform or from our website on what we call our creation journey. So, so a customer visits, um, essentially, you know, the, the, the products are made to, made to order and printed on demand. Um, just wanted to kind of give you a quick overview of how that works. And so for Kingdom of You, which is the book we, we recently launched, it, the, the book is all about um, the child's interests and favorite things. And um, it's a kind of fun story about how that, that sort of develops. And, it's about kind of you know recognizing that you know the child and kind of you know showing them that they're you know an individual and they've got um, you know they've got their own sort of uh, interest. So customers come to the website, um, they they enter the name of the child, they get to choose an adventurer um, uh, based on the diversity of the child. Uh, so ethnicity of child, sorry. And then in this book, they would choose their favorite food, they would choose their favorite interests. The book gets generated, they can preview the book. Uh, and they can, also, um, they can also write a personal message, a personal dedication to the child. So we, we kind of give a generic message, but you can add what you want. Uh, you can say who it's from, et cetera, et cetera. So the reason I'm showing this is become a bit clearer later on when I talk a bit about how we understand that and how we, and how we use that, that data. Um, so I'm often asked, what, what are we at Lost My Name? Uh, and I kind of um, was thinking about it uh, for this talk. And essentially, at heart, we're a creative company. We, we you know, the, the room, the building is half full of developers and half full of very East London creative types walking around with their beards and stuff. But they, they, they you know, they, they, there are a lot of writers, there are a lot of illustrators, there's a lot of very creative people constantly coming up with ideas and, and generating content. But of course, as well, fundamentally, we're a technology company. We, we you know, we, we build our own platform. We, we um, built the engine that renders the books. We built, uh, you know, the infrastructure, of course, using Solidus on the e-commerce side. Uh, and so we're definitely a tech company. Um, but, but, you know, uh, first and foremost, I think, we're, we're an e-commerce business, right? We, we make things, we sell things. Um, direct to our consumers, and so, um, so I was brought in about a year ago, I think, really to sort of focus on on the e-commerce side of things and how we kind of drive that. 
Um, but as, uh, as we've evolved as a, as a team and as a business, we're, we're now sort of supporting all of this within business intelligence and data science. And so I'm going to end my talk talking a little bit about how we've been doing that on the kind of creative side as well. As I mentioned, we, we support pretty much um, everybody, uh, everybody in, the, uh, in the business. I do a very, very quick slide on our infrastructure. I won't, I'm not going to go into uh, detail, um, but essentially just wanted to give you a sense that um, where we're collecting data from. So clearly we're collecting data from, from Solidus. Um, we're collecting all of our you know, order information, information about um, uh, shipments and, and sort of managing essentially anything to do with the transactions. We, we, pull, we pull data from all of our marketing partners. So we're a B2C business. We sell directly to consumers. Um, through, of course, all of the usual digital channel, um, chat channels like Facebook and Google uh, and, and Bing. Um, we, we do a lot of email campaigns, Pinterest, every, everything um, we, we do through, and we pull all of that data every day. So we know how much we're spending on campaigns. We know how much we're spending on ads. Uh, which we know how many emails we've sent, who's opened the emails, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we, of course, collect a lot of data on the website about what customers are doing on the pages, um, what, what they're seeing, what they're interacting with, what version of the website they're seeing. We run a tool called Optimizely, which, which allows us to do what's called A-B testing and show different versions of the site so we can understand which ones work best, um, which is great. We get data from you know, qualitative data. We ask customers questions directly. We collect data that way, which, again, I'll show you a little bit later on. Uh, and then a ton of other stuff. So Zendesk is our kind of uh, customer care center sort of tool, essentially manages communications between customers and our, and our customer support team, our angels, uh, data on our payments, user-generated information from like Google Sheets. We, we, we put it all together and we, uh, we string it together uh, using a tool called Luigi, um, which, is, which, is a, which is essentially a workflow, uh, open source workflow tool that Spotify developed in, 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 uh, in Python. Uh, and what it does essentially is it allows us to connect all of these different data sources load them into, uh, into our, our database infrastructure, uh, transform them, and then make them available to, uh, to our end users. So we, uh, we of course, use um, AWS um, across the business, and we use it as well in BI. So we use S3 as our kind of large storage, uh, and then Redshift as our database. We kind of call our database the truth. It's, it's essentially, um, there are lots of different pockets of sort of um, obviously data across the business, but we, we sort of treat um, our Redshift DB as essentially the, you know, the, the, business, um, the business truth, so where we've added all of our logic and enriched it and made it sort of ready for people to make decisions from. Very quickly, we published that in a couple of tools, a tool called Looker, which is fantastic. It allows you to um, essentially uh, code your data model um, um, really nicely through sort of version controls and Git and, and make that available directly. And a tool called Tableau, which is very visual uh, and very sort of rich uh, in terms of its interactivity. Uh, and, and gradually, we're, we're sort of working on some pretty cool stuff where we're, we're sort of the, the, the data we're generating, because we have visibility of all of this actually now starting to sort of pipe it back into our, our third-party tools and our marketing systems that, that don't have that visibility uh, and ultimately start driving better decisions within those about you know, how we optimize and how we target our, uh, our customers. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about, um, again, as I mentioned, how, how we're using information. Um, and the, the key starting area for us is, is on performance marketing. Um, it's, um, it's been a tough year uh, <laughs> performance marketing-wise. We, we do a lot of our marketing uh, through Facebook, we're still a relatively small business in terms of you know awareness and things, and so we do a lot of um, awareness driving and targeted uh, marketing through Facebook, um, um, and, and I've, I've mentioned the other channels. But what um, what's, what's really sort of uh, really really important is that you really understand the effectiveness that the activity is, is is having, and so we do something called attribution modeling, which may, some of you may have heard of. But essentially, what attribution models do is they allow you to see all of the sort of marketing touch points um, that, a, that a customer has had with you and your brand. Um, we, we're virtually all digital, um, apart from Christmas, which I'll talk about in a bit. And so what we, we've effectively done is um, uh, um, captured all of this information and then added rules and, and built various models on top of it to try to understand well, which, which campaigns, which channels are having the biggest effect, making sure, therefore, that we, we, we obviously invest directly uh, into, those, uh, into those channels and, and um, make sure that we're not wasting money on channels that are, that are, that are not been particularly effective for us. And the way, the way that our model works is um, we collect all of these essentially a digital footprint, so we know um, everybody, of course, who visits the website, at least from a cookie perspective. Um, we we kind of track when they visited, which marketing campaign, which channel they came from. We, we, we enrich this with other bits of information, so Facebook also can tell us who's kind of just seen an ad and not clicked it, were they across a different device from the one that they came back to the site later on. 
um, we, we, we do a lot of that information. And so effectively what we do is we build up these chains, um, which we then can add the rules across. We do a lot of cleaning to the data. Um, as you can imagine, um, the marketing data is all kind of collected from the front end through pixels and GA analytics tracking, which is, you know, um, is great, but it's, it's, it's not stable. Um, all these different third party data, you know, they, all, they all claim credit for all of the orders and you've got to do, you've got to do a lot of um, tidying up um, with that so that we spend a lot of time focusing on that. And then we apply our rules to it. So our, our, our model is um, reasonably, uh, I, think, I think, straightforward, but we've, we've kind of continuously supported it with some proper statistical analysis and backed up and sort of make sure that we're making the right assumptions. But effectively what we do is we, um, we, we cap our chains to 28 days. We only look at 28 days. We, we look at um, uh, things like what the customer did on the site. We look at things like whether a customer has come to the site via paid ad, then come back later that day we say just an organic sort of branded search or a direct visit and we kind of decide how we attribute the weight according to there so that we make sure that we've got um, the right um, the right decisions ultimately and the, the right focus on the channels that we, we know we should be investing in. Um, we then do a pretty cool thing in our model which, which um, um, confuses our finance guys um, but I'll, I'll, I'll try, and try and explain it to you. Um, what we then do is, is essentially we, we sort of project um, each day what we think the return on investment is going to be from our campaign. So, so we know that if we spent money, the money that we spent yesterday would have generated some orders yesterday, but it will continue to generate orders for another, another month, another two months, three months, et cetera, et cetera. So what we do effectively, we forecast that demand based on what we saw the return as being yesterday. Uh, and that's really important because what it allows us to do is sort of be much more reactive. So you don't have to wait, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks to see whether you think a campaign is working or not. If you see that you're getting efficiencies or you see that you're getting a good return in certain markets, you can make a decision to continue investing at that point, even if you haven't yet seen the full return uh, and your, um, you know, your sort of efficiency maybe, maybe doesn't look brilliant on, in the day, but kind of using this projection allows you to, uh, to sort of um, make the right call ultimately. And so kind of what we see as well with that is that the channels work differently. So, so Facebook is a channel that we're kind of just targeting people kind of out of the blue, right? We're targeting people that we think might buy from us. We don't know whether they have children. We don't know whether they've got an occasion coming up to buy for. Uh, and so it takes those customers a little bit longer essentially to decide to buy and, and ultimately purchase. Whereas um, on things like Pinterest and, and Google, where customers are actually searching for kids' gifts or kids' books, um, if we are able to target them correctly and, and, they, and we can get them to the site, they tend to sort of you know, convert much, much quicker. And so we, we build all that into the model uh, so that on a daily basis we're looking and understanding what, what uh, returns we get. So we get some additional benefits um, from, from this approach as well. We, we ran TV uh, during Christmas last year um, and what we were able to do um, quite, quite accurately was to say uh, effectively what, what did that do to us in terms, of, in terms of uplift, in terms of incremental orders. And the way that we approached it was looking at where essentially we had seen uh, a lift in, in what we call brand conversion. So people that we, ha we could see in the chains hadn't had any exposure to any other digital channels, but then kind of suddenly appeared to our site having searched for us, um, our kind of brand name or came to us directly. Uh, and we measured the lift in that uh, to understand how effective the TV, the TV campaigns were. And it was, a really, it was a really the first time, I think, that we properly understood television. It was, it was um, uh, run in 2015 as well, and no one really was quite sure if it had an effect or not. And so this time we were able to give a lot of transparency as to whether or not it had worked. Um, but also, we, we, we've learned um, quite crucially um, that the behavior um, does change um, from, from our customers around about Christmas. So I mentioned that our model um, is based on 28 days. If I was going to kind of extend this chart back from October to the beginning of year, it, that those lines don't change. That 28 day rule is, is, is absolutely fixed. What we saw this Christmas though was that the behavior really dramatically changed. Um, and what we saw happening was customers, um, the purple line, I'm not sure if you at the back can see it, but um, customers, in the perp uh, customers on the purple line are essentially are people who um, visited the site didn't buy straight away, but then came back later on. Um, and what we saw is a very dramatic um, change uh, in, in November, um, where, I mean, literally that first Monday in November, people switch into kind of Christmas mode. We were getting a lot of clicks through the ads. People weren't converting immediately, but they had effect effectively six or seven weeks to come back to the site and buy later on. And so it, it kind of sounds obvious, but uh, until you actually can properly quantify it and sort of see the points at which the behavior shifting and, the, and, and, um, and, and learn about how uh, you know, cost effective your campaigns were. It's really hard for us to know exactly where to invest. And so originally the budget was set, um, the peak uh, spend of the budget was set in the beginning of December, which was kind of you know, set 
by finance based on the previous year, whereas for the first time we were able to demonstrate that that was, that was absolutely the wrong time to invest. A, customers were less likely to come back, they didn't have as much time. B, um, it also got much more expensive. Once you get beyond Black Friday, it does become very expensive on Facebook. And so we've, um, we've, we've got a really big opportunity this year um, to invest much earlier and, and understand whether or not that's materializing into, uh, into December. We've also been doing quite a lot of work uh, on our, that's mostly focused on our acquisition side. Uh, we've also been doing a lot of work then on, on what we call our loyalty, uh, our loyalty um, schemes, so effectively customers that we've acquired, uh, trying to get them to come back um, uh, at all, more frequently, um, and, and, and sort of really driving long, longer lifetime value from the customers that, we, that, that we've, uh, we've managed to get. Um, what we've done with that is build essentially what we call a single view of customers. And so, for every customer, for every known user, effectively that we've ever we've ever seen, even if they've bought, or sorry, even if they haven't bought, um, we've got essentially every interaction that we can get our hands on um, that we know about that that customer. So, of course, things like their sessions, what they did on the site. So, they perhaps haven't bought a book, but maybe they've seen a book and interacted with it, uh, or visited our blog. You know, what ads have they seen? Have we retargeted them on certain campaigns? Have we emailed them? Are they opening the emails? Are they engaging with them? Have they filled in surveys? Have they had a customer complaint? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what that's allowing us to do is to start doing some really, really um, powerful segmentation and behavior analysis so we can understand what our, what our kind of interventions and our, um, you know, and our kind of marketing strategies are, are having an effect or not. <clears throat> so just one example, we, we're sort of looking now uh, at sort of understanding at what point, because we're, we're, we're essentially quite a seasonal product, you know, a lot of our sales come in Christmas and Q4, we're, 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 a, we're a book, but really we're, we're a gift, people, people tend to buy it for occasions um, rather than just for no particular reason, uh, and so um, looking at kind of customers that we've acquired and, and when they come back and how long it takes them to come back and sort of starting to develop hypotheses about which type of campaigns, and so customers are most likely to come back very quickly, um, once they've kind of received the book and understand a bit more about what it is, they, they of course come back at Christmas and that depends on what time of year we've acquired them or, or when they've got an anniversary. And starting to sort of build out this understanding of when um, cohorts develop and when, when customers come back and purchase allows us to really start thinking much more cleverly about our marketing strategies. Previously, we kind of just spend money on Facebook and you know targeting people that we know had bought. And what we've learned is that we, we need to be a lot smarter at that um, in terms of the points at which they're going to, uh, going to be ready to sort of come back to us. We're also learning a lot more about, um, um, as well, who's buying from us and sort of who they're buying for and what occasion, uh, and starting to see some really interesting differences in the, uh, in the behavior from those segments. Uh, and so um, I sort of had to flip the chart a bit because I realized nobody at the, the back would be able to read the bottom, so I put those to the top. But um, what we're looking at is um, we've been able to identify whether customers are, are aunts or uncles and they've bought for a niece or a nephew, whether they're grandparents, parents, friends, godparents, teachers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what we're looking at is essentially the percentage of those customers that, that, that come back to us and repeat, um, and repeat order. And broadly speaking, they're quite similar. But what's, what's pretty interesting is, is, is parents. That the, the, the business was very, very geared towards parents. You're like, right, parents are our, must be our big customer segment. They're the ones that you know, are the most loyal. You know, they're, they're the ones who are buying, uh, buying for their children. But when we, when we were able to sort of classify um, customers and then look back over time, we realized actually that they're our least valuable segment, at least from a, a sort of, um, uh, of the top three. Uh, the, the top three are worth more like something like 70% of our business. Um, even though all of our CRM activity, all of our customer marketing activity is geared towards parents, and it's you know it's, it's about in, you know activities with children and things like this, and so that was a bit of a that was a bit of a revelation, and we we're learning a lot more about why that is and, and what we can do about it, um, and you know, learning essentially that, that that parents have very different emotional rewards when they're buying for their children compared to grandparents and aunts and uncles who are buying for their children. We're starting to tap into some of those things as well. Um, so how do we know the relationships? I just wanted to kind of drop this in. Um, we, 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 we now can identify about three quarters of our customers, so of people who've transacted, we, we kind of know um, what their relationship to the child is. Obviously, people can buy for multiple relationships, and we, we classify those separately. Um, um, and we do that primarily uh, um, through customer surveys, but we also capture it from the dedications. And this is quite a, quite a sensitive topic because 
you know, it's obviously quite it's quite uh, personal information. Um, but but um, we you know we we're sort of we spoke a lot about whether or not it's something that we wanted to do and whether we should be able to do it or not. Uh, we, we can from a sort of T's and C's perspective, just whether we, we wanted as a business to be able to use that information. You know, and we, we, we generally speaking use it to, uh, to understand the cohorts and to understand the customers, but we effectively text mine um, from those dedications and, and learn that way. But we're also experimenting with something quite, uh, quite cool at the moment. There's, there's sort of this other quarter of customers that, um, that, we, that we don't yet have information for. And where we've learned that the relationship is important in terms of how we communicate to the customer what marketing activity we send and, and their ultimate buying patterns, we, we want to know as many of the customers and their relationships as possible. Uh, and um, we, we've sort of uh, experimented with a model at the moment that tells us, are they at least, you know, are they probably a granny? Um, are they somebody that, you know, is a, a grandparent? And we, we, we're finding, like, all the stereotypes, like, they, they, um, they, they take longer to make the book on the website. They're more likely to be on older devices and browsers. Um, Facebook gives us a little bit of information about age and things like this. And so we're using essentially all these other little touch points that we have to enrich our data and constantly feed that back into, uh, into, our, uh, into our system. Uh, I'm going to go through this reasonably quickly because I've, um, uh, I've only got about 10 more minutes, I think. But um, we, we, of course, do a lot of website um, conversion rate optimization, uh, like any, any good e-commerce uh, e business. So we do a lot of A-B testing. Um, one, of the, one of the really interesting things that we're finding uh, on that, again, and we look back retrospectively, um, essentially, the, the, the data that you're seeing is, is um, of all of the tests that we've run within this space, how many of them have generated a positive lift, how many of them have generated a negative lift, so not, not good, but also good that we've learned, um, uh, and also how many have basically made no difference. And what's really interesting is a lot of our focus actually has been on sort of very you know, product-specific related stuff, um, you know, around the canvas and around, around the creation journey. Um, but actually, we've kind of not got a brilliant hit rate. Like, you know, it's just we, we either have... Um, we, we've sort of historically um, found it quite, um, you know, you can almost do as much damage sometimes as you, as you do in terms of benefits. So, uh, you know, again, good that we've learned those things, um, but, but we want to we wanna focus on um, obviously what, what drives the stuff. What was really interesting is that the thing that consistently sort of does well and wins out is social proofing. And so we're sort of a lot of our, uh, a lot of our more recent product changes have been much more focused on not wholesale changes to the way that you make the book and, you know, placements of buttons and all these things that get, you know, designers are excited, but actually just kind of social proof nudges, you know, encouragement, uh, reassurance things, you know, just helping customers choose essentially. So talking about, you know, of course, things like reviews, we have them on the site, but things like um, talking about the fact that it's the world's most popular book, how many we've sold, that, you know, what's the highest rated, what's, you know, um, uh, in, in, in books where we've got choices to make, kind of, you know, helping customers and sort of you know, encouraging them when they have made a choice that it's, um, you know, that that was a, you know, they've done a, they've done a great job and they're an extra step of the way. And we're finding that those things at the moment are what driving really most of the benefit. And so we do a lot of work uh, in my team to understand our, our conversion funnel, um, where essentially we, we look at all the different traffic sources and where we land um, um, those um, those traffic sources. And Gregor was talking a bit about this earlier on. Um, obviously, you get you kind of end up with these maze of you know arrival points and and, and sort of um, traffic sources. And so, understanding from that how many of those make the book, how many of those bounce, how many of those go through. I think Gregor used the phrase threads. Essentially, how you know how far down the site do they get? Kind of forms the core part of our conversion funnel. And again, that really throws up some very interesting. Uh, insights. Well, these are the stages of the funnel and the conversion rates against essentially targeted traffic like on Facebook or display. So people that we've just targeted essentially, we think you know, you, you're a likely customer. Um, so we've gone after you versus people that we're bidding on keywords. So yeah, people have got an intent. So people again are looking for um, children's gifts. And what's kind of weird is that group, if you think about it, are much more qualified, yet they, they, we saw quite quickly that their conversion rate, their, their, their landing conversion rate, their bounce rates were high. Um, was, was much worse than our, our kind of Facebook uh, crowd. Once, once they've got through the book, they then are much more likely to continue. And so we're, we're now experimenting with basically different versions of the website, depending on what you've searched for. Uh, again, it's kind of 101 a little bit, but we're, we're at this stage now where uh, we want the site to expand. We want the site to you know, feel look and look different depending on what we know about you. And another uh, thing that we've been doing uh, for about six months now, which has is, which is yielded an incredible benefit, is, is we now have a, a, a survey that pops up on the site. It's effectively a trigger event that detects when the, uh, it thinks the customer is, is likely to bail based on dwell times and mouse movements and things like this. 
uh, and, and a little kind of survey generator pops up just asking them if they're, if they're thinking about not buying, trying to understand a little bit more about why. Uh, and you'll see some examples of how we use that data in, in a little while. Uh, and then very quickly, um, we're also um, testing, I think, some really interesting and innovative uh, new techniques. So effectively, we've mapped out what, um, what should be the perfect journey. So if you were going to come to the site and buy a book without any friction, um, what, what, what would that look like in terms of the stages that you go through? And so within our log data, within our hit data, what we're starting to do is quantify effectively any deviation from that. So uh, adding costs. So if I get to a page, kind of go back a step, or if I repeat a step, um, or if I count, of course, for any errors and things like this, then that generates a cost. And what we're what we're um, um, what we're starting to do, and we're starting to test, essentially, does that does that help us to understand whether those interactions increase or decrease the probability of a conversion? And so why that's important is um, while we understand, broadly speaking, the funnel and where we see dropout, what we want to understand is what's causing that dropout, and getting um, the user experience guys and the design guys to really focus on the things that we can demonstrate will add the most value. So if you can reduce the friction at this particular point, we can, you know, we can say with confidence that it's, it's something that, um, that will increase the likelihood of conversion, rather than what can sometimes happen is you get this mix of opinion or this mix of kind of, I know someone's watched like five videos and said, actually, I think this is, this is what we need to do. What we're looking at is across all of the sessions and, and you know, using you know, some, some, some advanced statistical techniques to say what are actually the things that are, uh, are going to give you the most, uh, most effect. Uh, and then I just want to finish quickly then on, um, again, what I think uh, are some really, you know, so kind of our next chapter effectively uh, within sort of data science that uh, lost my name, and that's around personalization. So we're, we're a personalization uh, company, um, and so I think we've got, I think we've got a unique opportunity to apply, uh, uh, apply some of these techniques to, um, to, to our, to our site experience. And so this is quite a controversial one. Um, 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 we, we've been, it's a bit of a live debate at the moment, um, and we're sort of discussing whether we think this is something that, 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 that we want to do. Um, but what we, what we see very clearly, uh, particularly with Kingdom of View, actually, was the book I mentioned earlier on, um, is that you, you get very clear gender biases in, 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 the, in the characters uh, and the stories that customers ultimately choose. So I noticed this when I, when I, when I, when I, um, when I was sort of going through the interview process and I made my book. Um, that, that, that the robot, um, you know, he's kind of, it works out in the end, you saw at the beginning, he's, he ends up being happy, but he's kind of miserable and it's quite dark and, uh, and you know, not a, not a particularly nice image. But if I was a girl, um, I'd get exactly the same um, version of the book. Uh, and that's true of, you know, that's true of all of the different, um, the different stories and the different, and the different characters. Whereas what I do know from the data is that almost two thirds of um, the, the customers that are buying a book for a girl with the letter R in the name, swap out the robot for, for the rabbit. The rabbit's much more, you know, it's much more colorful, it's a little bit more feminine. And we see this happening. And so sort of, you know, the debate we're having at the moment is, well, wouldn't, wouldn't we use that, right? So at the point at which a customer gives us information about the fact that they're buying the book for a girl, wouldn't we kind of construct the story that we think is more likely to, uh, you know, sort of appeal to the customer that's buying it from and then ultimately, you know, increase our, increase our conversion rates. But it's a fascinating sort of, tension between you know the sort of um, the kind of commercial opportunity but also just our values as a business you know we, we sort of um, you know we we, um, we we are I think more likely to lean on the side of you know we, we're a business that wants to be data driven but I think in this particular instance it's not it's not something that we're going to explore as an opportunity because um, because ultimately we think it's we don't want to we don't want to gender stereotype it, it gets more sensitive when in some other products so kingdom of view which I mentioned you'll see again in a moment uh, that has princesses and like you know literally like two thirds of customers choose princesses for a girl um, um, and so again we want to you know we want to kind of rise above that but it is it's been fascinating for me as a you know as a, whose job it is is to be objective and to help the business make decisions on this to to to, to see an opportunity that you know ultimately we've decided to to not take and I think you know for the, absolutely for the right you know for the right reasons but we see this we see this happening in other areas as well so um, we see, for example, um, different regional preferences. And so the, the sort of famous example, the, the guys in the room who've been here longer than me will remember this, but um, we have this angel character who's kind of a, like a rock chick and, and, um, and a bit fun. Um, but she, she's like hated um, in, in, in some parts of the world, particularly uh, in, in the southern states. We've got a lot of complaints about her. You know, um, she looks pregnant, she's a skank, et cetera, et cetera. It's blasphemous. And so in the end, we kind of do, we basically do a hard swap out for the aardvark. 
but one of the things that we're discussing at the moment, again, we, given we've got such great volume on loss by name, is actually wouldn't we use uh, regional preferences or you know preferences based on diversity, etc. That, that 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 we could we could again construct the book, and that's something we're going to test uh, a little bit later this year. Uh, but can we go even further? Uh, I think we I think we can. Um, uh, and we, we've, we've just started an experiment with this at the moment, and it's giving really good results. So I, I mentioned Kingdom of You, um, which is our book about interests and, um, uh, and the child's favorite food. And you know, basically, this, this kingdom that's for them gets constructed, and you know, there's a moral tale at the end and things like this. It's a really beautiful product. Um, but when we, when we launched the book, we did a, a preliminary survey, and we talked to customers about what they thought about it, what they didn't like, what they thought perhaps were going to be barriers to conversion. And what came out very clearly was that um, actually the likeliness to buy was, was, was really affected by how close you were to the child, so how likely you were to know the child well enough in order for you to create what you felt was a good, good personalised book. And so it kind of presents a bit of a problem for us because, you know, um, yes, parents, grandparents and uncle, aunts and uncles are you know, a, a big, our biggest segment. You know, if you've got aunts and uncles who are much less likely to make it than, than a parent or friends of parents, and again, you've got to be on that, you're, you're, missing a big, you know, you're missing a big opportunity in terms of your customer base. And we kind of launched the book, I think, knowing this, but still did it anyway. We really laid it on very thick about the book is about choosing the child's favorite things, celebrating the child, you know, celebrating your, that you know them well. And so the book, um, the content on the site talks a lot about this. It really emphasizes pick the best thing, pick the favorite, pick what they'll love, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, um, you know, we've since got rid of that because um, we, 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 we learned that it wasn't the right thing. But as I've shown you earlier on, as we increasingly get to know more about our customers and we know who they are, actually wouldn't we, you know, if I knew you were an uncle or an aunt, which I do now for you know, the majority of our returning visitors, like wouldn't we just actually try and sell it to you slightly differently? Wouldn't we position the book differently based on how we know your emotional, um, you know, your emotional rewards that you get from, uh, from buying and, and position it that way? Last thing, <coughs> uh, again, um, uh, I think which is pretty interesting, is the way that we've used data to actually inform the actual products themselves and so um, change effectively the creative um, material that we have and, and creative content that we have within our, uh, within our, within our products. And so we have, a, we have a story called The Intergalactic Journey Home. It's a fun book. The child effectively is dreaming. They, they wake up and think that they've gone on a space adventure. They see their name in the stars. Um, um, but what happens is they get lost and they have to find their way home. And gradually they, they meet aliens who kind of guide them back to the solar system and things. They, they fly by their city and see a landmark and, and ultimately they, they actually see a, an actual satellite image of their, uh, of their actual homes. It's pretty, you know, it's pretty amazing you know, for the sort of parents and, and, and for the children to sort of you know, recognize that. And you, my, my daughter's two and she still, pick, she still gets that it's her house and picks out the park and all this kind of stuff. It's a really magical, uh, it's a really magical um, exciting um, product for, for customers. The problem with it, um, um, when we first launched it, was that it's essentially a space book that looked like this. Um, you know, the cover was, was, was dark and, and um, you know, we, we saw a very, very clear um, bias towards boys. So all of our other products are absolutely down the line 50-50 in terms of boy-girl splits. Whereas on this one, we saw the conversion rate of customers buying it for girls much, much lower. Um, so only 30% to girls and 70% uh, and obviously to, uh, to boys. And so um, we kind of, um, you know, we, we, that's of course, you know, given, given it's, um, it's such a huge um, missed opportunity. Uh, in the end, the book was essentially was, was, was reskinned and, and, and parts of it were rewritten um, in order for it to be a little bit more gender neutral and try and sort of appeal more broadly. Uh, and that was, that, was, that was actually pretty successful. We saw uh, uh, overnight a 25% uh, increase in conversion rate of customers that were buying it for girls. We're, we're not at 50-50. I don't think we're ever going to get there in terms of you know, overcoming you know, um, centuries worth of you know, stereotyping. But, but essentially, um, it was kind of, a, again, a really, interesting, a really interesting sort of process to go through where we've used data to inform the creative process. Uh, and I think whereas where originally the creative guys uh, very, very early on were a little bit protective, you know, look, this is their work, you know, they, they, they've, they've come up with the story, they've done the research, et cetera, and they, they're happy with the product. Once you can kind of demonstrate that actually, look, we can, we can help sell more, we can help appeal to a much broader audience using this information, they've gradually come, you know, they, well, they have come around to it m massively. They're, you know, they're now continually looking for it and under, trying to understand where we can collect more information and feedback from customers to ultimately inform 
uh, their creative processes. Uh, and, and on this, the last example I wanted to give as well was around um, just around how, how that kind of came to head again um, with the satellite image. I was saying to you that that is like the USP really of the book in many ways. It's the book that kind of generates the most interest and it's the book we kind of leave, the, the point of the story that we leave with a lot of our marketing material. It's a big problem um, because um, A, not everybody knows the exact address. You're kind of at the mercy of whether or not Bing Maps can A, kind of geocode the address and, and generate a high enough quality satellite image um, um, for the customer that we were seeing um, this stage of the journey in the conversion funnel was with, you know, obviously a big, a big dropout and, and worse in some countries than others. I mean, um, we, we sort of validated that by linking, as I showed you earlier on, our customer surveys to that part of the funnel in looking at the comparative difference between it lost my name. And again, you know, kind of as we kind of expecting, but we're able to quantify it. We could see that customers were having problems with the map. They were having problems with the image. They didn't like the image. They didn't fully understand it. Um, and so what it allowed us to do was create a, a business case, a fairly compelling business case that said actually that we've got to, you know, we've got to, we've got to try and fix this. C customers were, we looked in a lot of detail, customers were seeing effectively blank maps, you know, the geocoding was getting it wrong and, and, um, and so it was something that we, we decided to try and tackle and, and, and invest time in the creative team and obviously the devs as well. And what we have now is a, is a, is a sort of a less addressed version um, of, the, of the journey. So you, you might not be able to see it at the back, but essentially we offer the customers the option at that point to say if they don't know the full address, basically they can just give us the town that the, that the, that the child lives in um, and gradually we'll, we'll, we'll sort of add um, a little bit, a little bit um, more detail if they want to. But what it does now is the site will generate a kind of a static template image of, of, satellite, uh, of a satellite uh, background. It's effectively an illustration, and so it really sort of, um, you know, from, from my perspective, from the you know, beginning and the end of the process, to sort of, you know, go through um, the conversations with the creative guys about that we, we need to kind of change the work here and, and, and sort of get us to something that a we know will drive increased conversion. We've launched this; we're now selling 10% of the books with this, and we're getting, you know, as I say, higher conversion rates through uh, that particular part of the site. Um, but it, it, it's also allowed us to open up other countries where the Bing map quality isn't good enough. It allows us to go to, um, um, you know, sort of other parts of you know, places like Canada, we struggle in terms of like car cargo and things like this. Um, you know, and so again, I think it's a really good example where the, the, sort of the data was used to create a commercial, uh, commercial sort of business case and a commercial motivation that ultimately we fed back into the uh, products that we're selling, um, selling and making ourselves. Okay, that's it. So I have five minutes of questions So when I look at what you've, you've shown us here, I, I see you know, a fairly sophisticated set of tools and, and, and insights that you're drawing from this that require you know, a lot of infrastructure and a lot of cross-functional collaboration. So what is it about Lost My Name, either organizationally or culturally, that you think has, has enabled this to um, yeah, great question. Just to repeat the question, the person in here, essentially, what is it about Lost My Name that, that uh, either culturally or as an organization um, has, has, has allowed us to be data driven and, and, and allowed us to start making commercial decisions? That's a great question. Um, I think, first and foremost, I think the business was always pretty data driven, is my understanding, you know, way back in terms of which letters should we start with is based on popular names and things like this. Um, so I think it always had that mindset. I think what it didn't have was maybe the sophistication about the types of questions sometimes that you should be focusing on or how you answer difficult questions. So that certainly from my perspective made it easy um, to sort of work in that way and was one of the reasons I came. I actually was, I was really impressed with the, um, the appetite um, and saw it, you know, um, from, from my perspective, there's nothing better than working with people who kind of want to work with you and want to answer, you know, answer these important questions. So culturally it was always there. I think the other thing that's allowed us to get so much done quickly is it's also a very, um, it's a, we've got a brilliant technical engineering team. Um, and so the ability to spin up a sophisticated, what is a pretty sophisticated uh, architecture that we've got now, you know, running daily, pulling in, you know, many, um, you know, many hundreds of thousands of um, uh, millions actually on a daily basis records from, from many dozen data points. 
Um, that isn't a barrier for, for, for me. I have two data engineers. We've got a wider engineering team without the out, and we're currently looking at, for example, site speed and the effect that's having. You know, the, the Dan's in the room now. You know, that that gets kind of that's a conversation between people at the coffee table, and then this thing streaming into your database, uh, and so that. Plus, as I said, the, the appetite to, uh, to sort of be data-driven is, is, is made, us, I think, pretty successful in a, in a short period of time. Okay, unless there's any other que question? Yeah? Do you find your best guess sells best? Like, you're, you're trying to find what the child might buy, by the, or the parent might buy for the child by the end, but is that what sells the best, or is it letting people customize and pick the wrong one away every time? Yeah, great question. Um, so the question was around whether or not essentially our default product, right, our best guess is the phrase that you used. Does that sell, is that the most popular or, or is the, you know, do we find that customization wins out? The, the answer is, um, um, is, origin, uh, is originally that it was, it, was, it was the customization actually. That's what customers see us as being our unique proposition, that, you know, the, the, that the fact that they can change it is kind of why they come and why they convert. I, I didn't mention it earlier on, but almost we've tried sometimes to take friction away from the journey. We've taken options away, and that's actually been detrimental. People like the fact that there's choice and that they can make choice. Um, so that's, that's kind of historically the true. What we're seeing now as we go forward is um, as, our, as our sort of product range expands, um, that, that's sort of not necessarily holding out uh, as much as we kind of go into new audiences and we go for new occasions. Uh, in some instances, actually, yes, speed of purchase and um, and um, and sort of, as, as I mentioned, kind of some of these personalization options, we're, we're getting better at sort of being able to get people to make the book faster. Uh, and so it's definitely something that we're, we're kind of keeping an eye on. But we're always conscious of the fact that, that, that we, we are our big proposition. This, it's the same with the dedication, actually. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of work's gone into figuring out, is it right to have it at all? Should we get it out of the way? Is it too much of a moment for customers? But every time, as I say, we, 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 um, we, we interfere with it or we try and change it, actually, we, we, we keep getting the same message back, which is that people, people, people really want to spend time. They, want, they, they love the product because they've, they've created it. Yeah. Uh, and so um, the personalization side is, is as much about these new audiences, as I mentioned, you know, getting that right quicker um, certainly helps us. You know, even if it just tips you sort of the extra 5% of customers that convert, that ultimately drives a, you know, drives a lot on our bottom line. Great. There's one more question. No, just one more question. Sorry, the gentleman. Uh, during your like data cleanup phase, do you feel you have to turn out people with ad blockers? Do they ruin all of your? Yeah, data? great question. Um, we we don't trim them out in the sense that we have we, we obviously have their um, transactions. We don't have their sessions. Yeah, um, and so they represent about four or five percent of of our of our total transactions. Uh, Jordan and I are trying to figure out at the moment how we kind of deal with that. We, our, our Solidus actually does collect some of that information for us um, to help us out. We, we just accept it as being, it, it's just, it, it's, uh, because it's consistently four or five percent, it kind of, you know, we, we just live with that, right? So we know that all of our data is going to be slightly out, but as long as it sort of remains at that level, then you can still make, you, know, you can still make decisions off the back of it uh, and live with it regardless. Okay. I've got to go, sorry, I've got another question, but I'll, I'll get on. Yep, one more? Right. Done. Yep, I'm done. Uh, thank you very much.